you can pray. Uh, we want you to pray and be seeking the Lord. And we want uh, as many kids here. The second thing is, is we want a kid that's connected to each and every person that's sitting in here to be in this auditorium for BBS. And then the third thing is, is we have been uh, posting this and sharing this on Facebook and uh, all of our social media platforms. So we want you to share that. Uh, we have an event on Facebook that you can invite people to. And so we, those are the three ways that you can help us. And if you want to volunteer, you want to help us out, you can see my set. That's for also Pastor Seth. Uh, at this time, if you return and welcome one another this morning. So Warner's uh, a part of our Senior Saints ministry, and she comes to all the events and activities. And uh, as I said, she's a certainly a blessing to me, a blessing to our church. And we love her. We ask that you pray for her as she continues to grow in Christ, and as we grow in Christ together. And we just uh, give the Lord praise for what he is doing in her life today. Upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This morning we had four candidates for baptism, and we have one that was able to make it this morning with us, and so we're so thankful for what the Lord is doing. We set a record this year with kids going to youth and children's camp. We took 58 kids and youth to church camp with us. I'd like you to stand with me. As we begin our worship, we ask the Lord to focus our hearts, and I give you this in mind this morning. We're focused upon the blood of Jesus Christ as we open our worship. And I want us to think about us going before the throne room of God. And as we're before the throne room of God this morning, we see the nail-scarred hands, we see the pierced feet, but we see the risen Savior. And we think about the blood of Christ, and we think about our sin debt being paid in full. 
We take a moment, we have busy times, busy weeks, summer plans, our jobs pull our hearts in so many directions. Will you go with me before the throne of God and may we draw near to the throne this morning as we worship and make much of Christ. Let us pray. Oh, precious Savior, we are here and it's all about you this morning. It's all about the one who bled and died, who lived the perfect life that we could not live, that we could have everlasting life. And Lord, as we enter, we pray that you prepare our hearts to draw us near to you. Lord, we celebrate this baptism today. Lord, many times it's young people and children, but Lord, to see a, a senior saint that is given their life to Christ is equally encouraging. Lord, today I pray for the families that are here, the children that are here. Pray for the word of God as it goes forth. Lord, may we get a greater glimpse of you this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's lift up our voices. We're going to sing about all the blood of Jesus.
same God that never fails will not fail me now. You and I, we stumble and fall, but we can count on the very faithfulness of the Almighty God, the sufficient blood of Christ. And here's the great thing. It's easy to praise God on the mountaintops, although it's often easy for us to forgive you on the mountaintops. But you may not be on the mountaintop this morning, as many people are not. You may be in the midst of the storm, and your God this morning is still faithful in the midst of the storm, in the time of undecision. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. The sovereign, sufficient one is
you to give God praise this morning.
into the children's worship. Some kids are already back there, but we still have some in the auditorium. You know, I don't like crowds in a mall. I don't like a big crowd in a restaurant, but I sure do like large crowds in a church. <laughs> Amen. This pulpit was made by Brother Robert D. Hart. He asked me what kind I wanted, and this is sort of what I wanted. And Solus Christus is Latin, and it means salvation through Christ alone. And so now I've got this big pulpit, and I believe in having a big pulpit. It means the Word of God's important. These little glass, transparent, flimsy things, that's not for me. I like a big pulpit, because the Word of God is powerful, and and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's so important, and it's all inspired, and uh, it's life-changing, and it cleanses us, it builds our faith, it convicts us of our sin. The Word of God is so important. And so if you have your Bibles today, turning the Word of God to Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 26, and I've entitled the message today, Making your life count for Christ. Driving home from work one day, a man stopped to watch a little league baseball game that was being played in a park that was near his home. And as he sat down on the bench behind the first baseline, he asked one of the boys what the score was. And the boy answered with a smile. He said, we're behind 14 to nothing. And he said, really? I have to say that you don't look very discouraged. And with a puzzled look, the boy uh, looked at him and answered, discouraged? Why would we be discouraged? We haven't even got up to bat yet. <laughs> the book, this book of Philippians that we are teaching through verse by verse teaches us that we can have the joy of the Lord in spite of our circumstances. And Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. And in spite of his state of affairs, I notice that he writes to the church at Philippi in verse 4, and he says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. He's doing it with joy. He had every reason to complain. Uh, he had been treated unfairly. He had every reason to be negative about his situation, but instead he had the joy of the Lord, and he was going out strong. He was making his life count for Christ. A young man came to W.E. Gladstone when he was prime minister of England, and he said, Mr. Gladstone, I would appreciate uh, you're giving me just a few minutes in which I might lay before you what my plans are for the future. And he said, I, I would like to study law. Yes, said the great statesman. And then what? Then, sir, I would like to gain an entrance to the bar of England. Yes, young man, and then what? And he said, then, sir, I hope to have a place in Parliament in the House of Lords. Yes, young man. What then, pressed Gladstone? Well, then I have to do great things for Britain. Yes, young man, and what then? And then, sir, I hope to retire and take it easy in life. Yes, young man, and what then, he tenaciously asked. Well, then, Mr. Gladstone, I suppose I will die. Yes, young man, and what then? And the young man hesitated, and then he said, I never thought any further than that. Yeah. And looking at the young man sternly, Gladstone said, young man, 
You are a fool. Go home and think life through. I must ask you this morning, what are you living for? What is the one thing which controls and commands your life? Is it the passion for money? Is it the desire for pleasure? Is it the desire for prestige, for power, for position? Whatever occupies our minds, whatever drives our emotions, uh, whatever we love in life, whatever commands our wills, it is the thing that tells us what we really are. And in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, the Bible tells us that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There is a pessimism about life and the meaning of life. We read in the Bible about those who wasted their lives with riotous living. Often we hear a lot of pessimistic statements in regards to life. But how refreshing the passage that we come to this morning. How refreshing to hear from someone who has found real meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life as we read Paul's words. The Apostle Paul gives us his philosophy of life in verse 21. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is is gain. Isn't it refreshing to listen to someone like Paul who has found out what life is really all about, who has found out that life can have purpose, that life can be wonderful, that life can be positive, and that life can have real fulfillment. This morning I want to talk to you about your life. I'm, not, I'm going to encourage you not to waste your life. I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a real good look at what life is all about. Notice, first of all, Paul's resolve. He says his resolve is for me to live, verse 21, is Christ. And in these verses that we have before us, Paul shares with us several aspects of life. Someone said that life is what you, what you are alive to. What you're alive to. For instance, you and your wife, you go into the department store and you walk by the dresses and all of a sudden your wife really comes alive. She sees a dress she likes and she comes alive. Or, or some of you men, you go a little further and you come to the sporting goods section and you see these fishing rods and you, you see the golf clubs and all of a sudden, immediately you come to life. Life is what you're alive to. Notice what Paul says about life. He says, for me to live is Christ. He says, that what I'm living to is Jesus Christ. For Paul, Jesus is the basis of life. For Paul, Jesus is the beginning of life. For Paul, Jesus is the bounty of life. For Paul, Jesus is the beauty of life. For Paul, the Lord Jesus is the benediction of life. Paul says that if you wrap it all up in one sentence, for me to live is Christ. That's my philosophy, he says, of life. I wonder if you can say that today. I wonder if there are those of you, and I believe there are some among us this morning who can say, for me to live is Christ. Let's examine the statement a little further. Number one, I see that this, this life he has in Christ is very personal. Notice that he says in verse 21, for me, personal pronoun. For me to live is Christ. He's talking about how very personal this Christian experience is. Being a Christian is not just a matter of going to church. Christianity is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in a very impersonal world. If you go down to the division of motor vehicles to get your permit renewed, they will tell you to pick a number and then go sit down. 
that they don't call out your name, they call out your number. Uh, the same thing is true in many restaurants. Not at Rubens, but in, in many restaurants, <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, they, they give you a number, you go uh, and get your food when they call out your number. But the Bible tells us that God is personally interested in us. And one time Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and I know them by name. The Bible says that really our names are, were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. There really are no new names written down in glory. You read in the Bible about the Antichrist, and you will find those who follow him have a number. So impersonal. 666. But God's people don't have numbers. They have names. God knows you and you're special to him. The relationship that you can have with Christ is a very personal relationship. Isn't that great? If you have truly repented of your sins and you have accepted Jesus Christ, believing that he died for you and rose from the dead, you can grow to know him personally as an individual on an intimate basis. Secondly, this life that he has in Christ is practical. It's personal, it's practical. Verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ. He's talking about really living. A lot of people don't really live. A lot of people just exist. A lot of people endure life. They do not really understand why they are living. For many people, life is kind of like a grind. I mean, they get up in the, at the same time every morning, right? And they eat the same meal for breakfast every morning. And they get in the same car and they go to the same office and they go through the same routine every day of the week. For them, living is merely existing. I heard about a guy who was being buried by his request in a gold Hummer. They opened up a big hole in the ground and the guys were working to get that big old Hummer down in the ground. And one of the guys said to the other, that's really living, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of people think it's really living, but it, it's not. It, it's not just how many things that you have accumulated. It's not how many toys you can acquire for me to live. Paul is saying to us this morning, I have found out the meaning of existence. I may live right now in a dark, damp dungeon because of my stand for Christ and my spreading the gospel, but I have found out the purpose of life. And for me, living is Jesus Christ. He even led many of those soldiers that guarded him and the Praetorian Guard to Christ. A lot of people never understand that your faith in Jesus Christ affects your life. But if it's real, it does. It does. Every aspect of your life should be touched by your relationship with Jesus Christ. Every aspect of it. Paul's philosophy of life was it's personal to me. <coughs> to me, it's practical to live. It's the real life. And, but not only that, he lets us know that it's possible. For me to live as Christ is possible. You might say, preacher, that all sounds well and good. I would like to have this kind of life and enjoy this kind of experience, but I'm not sure it's possible, Pastor. I have tried to live the Christian life and I can't live it. I just don't have the power to do it. I have something to share with you this morning. I don't have the power in and of myself to do it either. I can't leave it either without the power of God, without the indwelling Holy Spirit, without Christ in me. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. I was thinking about how I could get this across, Christ in me. So I thought of Mike Tyson. His career is obviously over. But I don't care if his career is over. 
Uh, you're not going to get me in the ring with him even now. <laughs> I, I remember from biting a uh, guy's ear off. Uh, you remember that? Or half off anyway. He must have really been hungry to do that. I don't know. But, uh, I, I, I know that I wouldn't stand a chance. I mean, I boxed a little at the Y as a teenager growing up. But, but let's just suppose that somehow as I got into that ring, Young Joe Lewis, when he was young, or maybe Rocky Marciano or Muhammad Ali somehow got inside of me. Let's just suppose that as I faced Tyson, it would not be me alone fighting, but that it would be a world champion fighting in me and through me. There might be some possibility I could beat Tyson. And that is exactly what it means when you come to know Christ. Christ comes into your life and, and into your heart. And I can't help but think of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that says, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Christ life, Christ lives through you. It is Christ in your life that gives you the power to live the way that you should live. And it is true that you're responsible to grow. Yeah, we're to grow in our experience. We're to grow in the Word of God. Uh, we're to grow in the reality of our standing in Christ. So that in our daily lives, we live in fellowship with Christ, studying his word, communing with him, and depending on him for everything in life. I need thee, oh, I need thee. It means growing to know Christ intimately, found in Philippians 3.10, where Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. It means growing to love Christ with all my heart, soul, mind, and being found in Luke. And also in Mark chapter 12, and verse 20. It means submitting all of my thoughts and my emotions and my words and my deeds to the Lordship of Christ. And, and so that I will please him in all aspects of my life. Found in Colossians 1.10. It means growing to experience Christ as my all in all, found in Ephesians 1.23 and also found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. Every aspect of life must be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. The glorious person of Christ and nothing less is the Christian life. What is your resolve this morning? What what is your philosophy of life today? What are you living for? Paul says that my resolve is for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's go to the second major point. We go from Paul's resolve to Paul's ministry. And Paul says to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, he tells the Christians at Philippi. I want you also to notice that Paul shares with us his ministry. Keep in mind that Paul is writing his letter to the believers at the church of Philippi. And he started that church. He had led many of these people to faith in Jesus Christ. He has come to the conclusion that he's not going to die yet, but that rather he is going to live. And as he looks at living, he looks at the whole idea of his personal ministry to these people. And he's looking at the ministry that God has given to him, uh, to these Philippian believers. And in Paul's ministry, we learn some things about what life really means and how to have purpose and meaning in life. Let me give you some things. First of all, Paul's ministry is needful. It's needful. So is yours. But look at verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. He's talking about his ministry to them. He goes on in verse 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh 
is more needful for you. For me to go on living and not go to heaven is more needful for you. Paul is talking about the ministry that he's going to have with these people. And he is convinced that this ministry is going to be needful for them. I want you to notice Paul's focus in life. Because we can learn a lot from this. He is not focusing on himself. Rather, he is focusing on other people. In fact, if you will notice in verse 24, verse 25, and verse 26, five times he uses the word you. You. He, he's thinking of them. He, he talks about them. His focus is not on himself. He is living for the benefit of other people. He is living his life not to satisfy himself. He is living his life in order to benefit the lives of other people. And he says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance of joy, the joy of faith. Did you notice that word furtherance in verse 25? Notice that Paul uses this word in verse 12. He talks about the furtherance of the gospel. It's a word that means to cut in advance. It's a word that means to go before. It's a word that means to cut before. It's the picture of advancement. It's, it's the picture of, of progress. And Paul is saying, I'm convinced that my ministry is needful for you so that you will make progress so that you will advance in the Christian life. You know, when I'm playing golf with some of the, maybe the guys in the church, and maybe we're not having such a good day at playing, I, I try to encourage them. I say, keep on progressing, keep on advancing, keep on pursuing. I said, we're a little closer to the green than we were, you know. Uh, uh, we are to grow in the Christian life. And one of the ways people grow and mature in their Christian life is by mentoring other people. Older, more mature Christians being a blessing to younger, inexperienced Christians. And that's a biblical concept. Paul wrote to Timothy about it, how the women are to minister to the young ladies and the men to the young men. And, and, and Paul even did that himself for young Timothy. Uh, Timothy was not his biological son. Timothy, he did call him his son, meaning in the faith. He probably led Timothy to the Lord and he impacted his life. And Timothy became a pastor in Asia Minor at the church of Ephesus. God really used Timothy. But Paul impacted his life. I want to encourage our Christian brothers and sisters here at Faith Memorial to get interested in some young Christians and to be a mentor to maybe some new believers. Help them grow. Help them mature in the faith. If you really want to enjoy life, I would encourage you to find some young Christian and just be an encouragement to them. You couples who have been married 40 years or more, find some young couple and disciple them and, and teach them how to be faithful to the Lord and, and how to love their church and, and how to learn to love one another and to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice also, though, Paul's ministry is not only needful. Paul's ministry is joyful. Look at verses 25 and 26. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance, the joy and joy of faith. Joy. Go on down to verse 26. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So Paul's ministry is not only needful, he is convinced that his ministry to them will be joyful for them. Do you bring joy to other people? Are, are you a source of joy to other people? When, when people see you coming, are they glad or are they sad? And in the lives of other people, are you a misery or are you a ministry? Helpfulness and happiness, get this, Helpfulness, helping other people, and happiness go together. This past week, it, it's been on the news that social media has contributed to depression in our young people today. 
I mean, they feel that they can't do anything right. They, they can't enjoy life. Uh, they have very few friends. They feel that life has no purpose. They feel that they are not useful. And so young people, they go home and they lock themselves in their rooms and they spend hour after hour after hour on social media. And it's having devastating effect upon young people and some adults psychologically. They rarely go outside as we did. We used to spend six to eight hours a day. We made our own toys. My brick, bricks were cars and sticks were guns. And, and, and we did our own thing. I mean, we stayed outside. We didn't even have a TV growing up. The only electricity we had is when we turned the light on. But they rarely go outside like we did. And, and as a result of their isolation, social media... Teen self-harm, hospitalization, this is a fact, it, it was given last week, is up 163%. Because of the alarming increase of suicide among our young people, Congress right now is considering a bill that would not allow young people to have a cell phone until they are at the age of 16. I think one of my grandchildren, this teenager, said, I don't agree with that. <laughs> but it, I think it's needed. Social media is doing a great deal of harm psychologically to our youth and to our uh, many adults as well. And as mature Christians, we've got to get across to our young people and to even some of our adults that God has a purpose for their lives, that they are important to God, and that if they will make their lives count for Jesus and get out, of the house and build some friendships and start making some connections and, and have some relationships, God can use them greatly. The more helpful you are to other people, the happier you personally are going to be. If you want to be miserable, I'll tell you how to do it. Just live for yourself. Live for yourself. If, if you want to be joyful, then live for other people. Right. Amen. Booker T. Washington, the great black scientist, said this, and I quote. He says, in meeting men in many places, I have found that the happiest people are those who do the most for others, and the most miserable people are those who do the least. After dealing with people all my life, having been raised in a pastor's home, having pastored almost 43 years of my life, I have found that to be true. When you get interested in other people and you have a ministry in your lives, you know what it does? It brings you personal joy. It brings joy. Our lives should be a joy to other people. And in so doing, it will be a joy to us. In Paul's ministry, he says, it's needful for you that I go on living in this life. He says that it will cause furtherance of your joy of faith in verse 25. And then we see that Paul's ministry is fruitful. Notice this. Look at verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. The Bible compares the Christian life to a fruit tree. In Psalm chapter 92, verse 12 and verse 14, it says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still, get this older people, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. What a tremendous statement that is. Even in old age, you can be fruitful. I remember we had a cherry tree growing up. And we loved that cherry tree. It's those big cherries. It wasn't those little small, bitter cherries. It's big, luscious cherries. And man, we could fill gallon after gallon. And, and, but something happened to that tree. And it quit bearing fruit after about 20 years. There are some fruit trees that just quit bearing fruit. And there are some professing Christians that they reach a certain age and they just quit bearing fruit. One of the evidences that you're truly saved is that there is some fruit in your life. 
There's a young man in the church. He's asked me three or four times, when are you going to retire? I can bench more than he can. He's 23. I can bench 225. I, last year, uh, three or four months ago, I, I walked in the Jimmy Rich run, and I walked it, but that's three miles. I, I could go out and walk five miles today. I can do more push-ups than he can. I, I'm, I'm too healthy to retire. I'm not even on Medicare yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to say it while I can. But. I promise you this. When I'm as old as Joe Biden and have his <laughs> cognitive skills or lack of them, I will retire. <laughs> you know, I really believe deep in his heart he wants to retire. And we can help him in November. <laughs> Of 2024. <laughs> and I tell you, it's a lot of pressure being the president. I, I know that. They certainly need our prayers. But we find here that there are some fruit trees that just quit bearing fruit. And, and that is not to be true among in the Christian life. I, I don't care how old you get in the Lord, according to the scriptures, you can still bear fruit in old age. And, and did you know uh, a Christian is immortal until God is through with him? Amen. Uh, our security, some on our security team, they, they want to put plexiglass up here. They worry about my safety. I, I will tell you now, that's why i got a big hole right here now. See, in this deep hole. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere that God is through with me. He has my number. It is appointed unto man wants to die and after death a judgment. God is leaving you here because he is not through with you. It's not God's will that you go into seclusion and, and go around depressed all the time and just go through life and waste your life and sit in your house and never get out and, and mingle with people. Just, just like Paul, you're needed. And just like Paul who is in prison, he wants you to be joyful and he wants you to be an encouragement to others in the work of the Lord. God doesn't want you to just live for yourself. He wants you to live for other people. It's not all about you, friend. Amen. We are to multiply fruit for Christ. Thirdly, in last, Paul's dilemma. You say, he's in a dilemma? He says, I am in a straight betwixt two. That's the King James Version. He says, I'm torn between two desires. Look at verse 23 and 24. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He has already said in verse 21, to die is what? Gain. To die is gain. And he's already said that he is convinced that God wants him to live a little bit longer. He is saying, I can't decide which... I desire of which I choose. Paul is saying I'm hemmed in. Uh, Paul is saying I have a, a delightful dilemma. I'm torn between two. Either I will live here, and if I do, I will have a ministry in your life. Or if I die, that will be gain for me. Paul is saying I've got a delightful dilemma. Some of you remember Dr. J. Vernon McGee, who was on the radio all those years. He sounded like a, a country boy. But he was an excellent Bible teacher, well educated. He got cancer and he's dead now. But he said that one of his listeners wrote him when he got cancer and said, Dr. McGee, I've just heard that you have cancer and I'm praying that you will die and go right on to heaven. And he said that I wrote her back and I said, sister, you let the Lord decide that. You can't do that kind of praying. <laughs> All of us want to live as long as we can, right? Most of us want to stay here as long as we can. But Paul says to go and be with Christ is far better. He says to die is gain. Paul was pulled in two directions. Paul says, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And I have a desire to stay here and minister because you need me. 
Paul really believes what he says about death. Do you really believe what we say about death? Do you really believe it? Has it really gripped your heart as a believer? To say that death for the believer is to depart and be with Christ and is far better and that it is really gained, has that really got through to you? Do we really believe it? That it's a promotion right into the very presence of God? I heard about a lady who was on a train and she was traveling to Arizona and the train got in some difficulty and they thought that they might have a crash and that there would be loss of life. There were some brake issues, I think. And, and, and through all of the time of crisis, they eventually navigated through. And she was calm the whole time, just calm and collected. And after it was over, they asked her, why are, are you so calm? We can't believe it. I mean, we were facing possible death and you were calm. And she said, well, I'll tell you. She says, I'm on my way out to Arizona to see one of my daughters, but I also have a daughter who died a few years ago and went to heaven. And whether I live or whether I die, I was going to see a daughter. And that's all. Either way is all right with me. Do we believe that this morning? To die is gain. Having a heart to depart and be with Christ which is far better. I conclude with this. Jim Elliot and four other young men were consumed with doing the will of God for their lives. And in 1955, these five young men, all under the age of 35, gathered in Ecuador with a vision of reaching a tribe of Indians called the Alka Indians who lived deep in the rainforest. And this tribe particularly was known as the Savage Tribe by other tribes around. No one had ever presented this tribe the gospel of Christ. These five missionaries, all highly trained and deeply devoted to God, began praying about making contact with the Indians. In September, they began flying over the Alka village in an airplane, and, and they, uh, they would, uh, they had a pot, and they would drop gifts down to the Alka Indians. Eventually, the Alka Indians took the gifts. But they finally decided it was time for them to go and meet these Indians. So they established a bank, a base camp on the sandy beach uh, of, of the Cure River. And on January the 8th, 1956, about 3.30 p.m., they were speared to death by Indians who mistakenly thought they had come to hurt and harm them. The news just shocked the world. I mean, many people wondered how young men whose lives were so promising could waste their lives that way. What they didn't realize at the time is that as a result of the death of those five young men, tens of thousands of young couples surrender their lives to go to the mission field. God providentially used that to further the gospel in a greater way. When the journals of Jim Elliot was published several years later, they found this sentence. Listen to this sentence. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The Apostle Paul would agree. I would agree. And I hope you agree. Once you decide that your life here won't last forever, then you are free to invest it in a cause that is greater than yourself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as a result of being here today, there are some young people, some young families, some older saints that maybe have been coasting that will say, hey, we're limited in our years. Time is flying by. We've wasted a lot of years, but it's time that we got serious about the things of God and made our lives count for Jesus Christ. We're going to stand before him soon. Lord, work in hearts, work in lives. 
If there's any here without Christ, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would soften their hearts and may they come running to Christ in true repentance and faith. Lord, work among us, work in us, work through us to bring glory to your wonderful name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.